The Final Fantasy VII Remake and its ending are a really curious case. A lot of people have already put their two cents in, and it's not just people pigeonholed into being one of the old guard or being one of the new blood. Practically everybody has something to say about it. And you may be looking down at the date and notice your boy is very late to the party, I know. But still, I've been sitting with these thoughts for quite a while and wanted to express them. So kick back and enjoy as I tell my take and impression of the Final Fantasy VII Remake's ending and future. This video is split into three parts, so go ahead and skip to the time shown for a specific topic if you want to go about it like that. Special thanks to Skilled Guy for the remake gameplay footage in the background. And yes, I'm using Fandango movie clips for Advent Children. The video is already taken long enough as is, so I'ma just take that watermark to the jaw when I need to. Enjoy! While modern remakes of classic video games are far from a new concept, a remake of such prestige and build-up has never truly been seen before, and to be honest, it may never be seen again. Few games have ever made such a stunning international impact as Final Fantasy VII, but I'm not gonna sit here and state the obvious. I'm also not gonna sit here and act like I was there in the trenches back in 97 to see it all go down. By the time I was born, the original release of Final Fantasy X wasn't even a year away, so all I can truly do is analyze and take everything in hindsight. This is true for me regarding a vast majority of the Final Fantasy titles, including 7, to an extent. I say to an extent with hesitation because the world of Final Fantasy 7 is something I'm actually familiar with. It was actually a big part of my childhood and laid the groundwork for me to recognize and acknowledge the franchise as a whole. I'm being vague about it because to many, what I experienced wasn't a uh, fondly remembered part of this particular installment. Yes, I'm talking about the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, a stylistic typhoon of gungagas and dilly-dally shilly-shallies. The compilation is composed of supplementary content to FF7 in the form of four games and two animated films. Now, some are more well-known than others, I'm sure many people are aware of the likes of Crisis Core and Advent Children, but of course, there are the more obscure titles. Like Before Crisis, which was a mobile, 24-part, episodic, subscription-based product distributed by a single Japanese phone service provider. So, you know, really just screams availability. Y'all saying Skyrim gets around. The next smart fridge would be doing a disservice if it didn't come pre-installed with this Turk spin-off game. Show me RE4 running on FOMA mobile devices, then we can start comparing apples to apples, alright? And on the animation side, we have Last Order, which was only ever officially released with a specific physical version of Advent Children that had a limited run of 77,777 copies. Cute? Sure. Annoying as shit to track down without spending a fortune? Very. And trust me when I say the esteemed glory of having Last Order run straight from the DVD onto your screen is not worth that fortune. It was produced by Madhouse. That is a factual statement. Then there's Dirge of Cerberus. Then we have Crisis Core and Advent Children. Now these two are where I'll stop being such a shit, but only a little. Because these two, while they do hold a genuinely very special place in my heart, they got their fair share of... fucking stank. AC more than Crisis Core in my opinion, but that's besides the point. Even after casting aside the rose-tinted goggles of ice gripped to my face, the fact still remains as to how important they are to me. My very first JRPG was Crisis Core, and one of the first movies I ever remember watching was Advent Children. As such, a lot of the memorable things people remember about Seven come to me in the form of their compilation counterparts slash equivalents. I was immersed in the western and dreary nature of Benora and Edge City instead of the neopolitical drapings of Midgar. The iconic opening chords of Let the Battles Begin was instead the very, very persistent announcement of Activating combat mode. Zack Fair was my Cloud Strife. Genesis was my Sephiroth, which, trust me, out of all these differences, I fucking wish was not the case. 
and all that rad motorcycle combat and over the top action from Advent Children ranks up there with Devil May Cry and how it has fried my brain into tolerating nothing but drop kicks and crazy background guitars. So, how does this factor into the remake? Well, if you remember, I stated that there were four total games in the compilation, but only noted three of them. That's because, as revealed in the 7 Remake Ultimania, Final Fantasy 7 Remake is the fourth game in this FF7 Extended Universe, and the fifth installment overall in the compilation, Last Order evidently being the one that was ousted from the official lineup. I wonder why. Regardless, the remake's confirmed placement within the still ongoing going compilation does insinuate that the development team, people like Tetsuya Nomura and Yoshinori Kitase, that actually worked on Advent Children and Crisis Core are still holding these projects close to their hearts. They want to refine their previously established concepts and fully integrate them into this new era of storytelling for Final Fantasy VII. That can be said with the concepts found in the original game as well, I mean, that's the entire point of a remake. At least, a traditional remake. But we'll get into that later on. But how does the remake even integrate the compilation? Beyond the obvious tease involving an alternate timeline where Zack Fair did not die during his battle with Shinra at the end of Crisis Core, the Ultimania once again comes to the rescue in the form of confirming a nod to Advent Children. In Chapter 18, during the boss fight against the Whisper Harbinger, it calls upon a trio of goons to battle you on foot. These are Whispers Rubrum, Viridi, and Crokeo which battle with a single blade, a single fist-mounted weapon, and two handguns respectively. Initially, this could be construed as Destiny's natural defense mechanism to the invading natures of Cloud, Tifa, and Barret. But instead, the Ultimania explicitly draws the connection to Advent Children, namely the film's antagonists, Kadaj, Laws, and Yazo, who fight with similar weaponry. What's more, during the battle's climax, the three Whispers fuse into a Whisper version of Bahamut, much like how Kadaj summoned Bahamut Sin in Edge City during the film's second act. Relatively subtle, yes, but another example of how eager the development team is to take another crack at winning people over with this once divisive content. And so, the stage has been set. My illicit love with the compilation laid bare and a quote-unquote brand new journey into this world put in front of me. A full-on review of the remake will be something for a later date, maybe on its one-year anniversary. But for now, I specifically want to talk about bar none the most controversial aspect of the remake its ending. There are many moving pieces, and as I noted earlier in the video, I am aware I am late to the party. Many of you may already know the more intricate and interwoven details. Even so, I'll continue on in hopes that you'll be able to gleam something from my perspective, and hell, maybe you'll discover something you didn't prior. Alright, now to get to the goods. Ah, chapter 18, Destiny's Crossroads. A bold, wild ass roller coaster of speculation, subversion, and meta narrative. For those who may not have the story fresh in their mind, or may not have even played through the game, I'll give a very short and concise summarization of the events leading up to this. Throughout the game, the plot and general story plays out very much like the original. The only entirely new plot point is the Whispers, manifestations of the planet's will that act as arbiters of fate. What that means is that they exist to ensure the events of Final Fantasy VII take place, regardless of how the in-world circumstances make the story naturally divert from that path. They realign things in a very direct and aggressive manner, and refuse to have any meddling interfere with the preordained fate of the cast and the world. The only exception to this is everyone's favorite villain, Stabo. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, Sephiroth. That's, 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 that's not it either. Se Se Sephiroth, his name is Sephiroth. Sephiroth, who appears in person much earlier than he did in the original, and seems oddly aware of everything going on with the Whispers. Try as they might, for one reason or another, Sephiroth finds a way to cast away the Whispers as he sees fit. While he still focuses on Genova, he pays special attention to Cloud, and their relationship is notably different than in the original Final Fantasy VII. No longer is Cloud a barely memorable 
sole puppet or pawn in the grand scheme of Sephiroth's reunion of Genova, but he now looks to him as an equal, as if they've done this before, as if he knows how this goes down. Regardless, the plot continues as per the original. Aerith is kidnapped during the fall of the Sector 7 plate, and the crew race to the Shinra HQ to save her. After the battle on the Midgar Expressway, Cloud and the others find themselves face to face with Sephiroth yet again. He stands there, menacingly, before invoking the Whisper's wrath by instigating a fight between the party and himself. He disappears beyond into the singularity and awaits Cloud to follow him. In reality, his plan is to have Cloud subdue the Whispers to a point where Sephiroth can control them, thus fully harnessing this destiny-defying power he possesses. The fight ends, and Sephiroth continues to be cryptic even after his apparent defeat, leaving Cloud with a handful of comments, the most notable being seven seconds till the end. As revealed in the Chapter 18 synopsis, this refers to the world Sephiroth pulls Cloud and the gang into being seven seconds away from destruction by Meteor. Cloud comes to outside of Midgar, and the crew commences their hunt for Sephiroth. Jesse and Biggs live, Zack lives on in an alternate timeline, and the unknown journey is promised to continue. Fate itself has been defied, to what extent we don't truly know yet. Various interviews in the Ultimania, I feel like I've said that a lot in this video, have attempted to reassure people that the iconic moments, locations, and story of FF7 will be kept intact, but that has done little to smooth over this cavernous divide between the fans. Man oh man, we got a lot going on here. A lot to digest and a lot of opinions, across a wide range of emotion as well. There are those who are excited about the development team not being tied down by the original, those who feel betrayed by the concept of the story diverting so harshly, and most notably, those who shudder and raise the pitchforks against the world's enemy, the vile fiend only murmured about in hushed tones, the mastermind of a world of keys and hearts and data and X's and Disney characters, the one and only Tetsuya Nomura who sits in the remake's director's chair. It's a bit of a meme at this point, but many do harbor a genuine disdain for him being this involved, as the story of Kingdom Hearts is a less than convincing affair for a majority of the population. Even people who love those games are just kind of sitting there, nodding their head, and staring blankly at an exposition about whatever the fuck Xehanort's deciding to do this game, and waiting for a new wondrous world or sick boss battle. Many parallels have been tied to Kingdom Hearts' over-the-top plot and Chapter 18 of Remake. Whether it's the aesthetic similarities between the Whisper Harbinger and the Heartless, the esoteric set pieces like the Edge of Creation, or the general, grand, universe-spanning nature of the game's ending, Chapter 18 comes after a comparatively tame retelling of the story, and a vocal critique seems to be that it's a sudden, bloated, self-indulgent crescendo orchestrated exclusively by Nomura to tie into Kingdom Hearts, as he laughs maniacally, pissing on the fond memories of Final Fantasy VII and shoveling money into his mouth. Is this mentality a little volatile and reactionary? Yeah, at least from my perspective. Nomura and the team aren't trying to tap dance on anyone's grave. It is very clear that the team does not want to fuck this up, but they also understand that they can't be so petrified that they can't take risks or branch out in an interesting way. No event in the original is explicitly ruined by the game's final chapter. You can argue potential implications or insinuations, but the fact stands no real blood has been spilled. And if you think this development team is just frothing at the mouth to compromise the emotional resonance of Seven's story, I honestly think you're looking at it in an unnecessarily negative light. Nomura is surrounded on all sides by people who worked on the original game, Crisis Core, in almost every corner of the compilation. Good lord, the man himself also worked on Seven before he became the head director for a majority of the preceding Final Fantasy titles. This is a Final Fantasy Seven development dream team. Now, don't get it twisted. The ending is not perfect, even if I'm all for the concept. For new players, Chapter 18 is surprisingly unapologetic about just leaving you in the fucking dark in terms of information, which is strange considering the rest of the game 
game actually does a really solid job laying out the story in a comprehensive manner for new players. But then, we never truly get an explanation for Sephiroth beyond that he was a soldier Cloud admired, and then Zack shows up. Dog, no new player remotely knows who the fuck this is or what the fuck is going on. To someone brand new, we get one implication about Aerith's first lover being a former soldier, and the shot of them walking past one another near the end could be construed as the nod to Zack being that soldier, but that's a bit of a stretch. The whole recreation of Crisis Core comes out of left field for new people. Don't get me wrong, I fucking love it and was on the verge of tears, but the fact still stands. I think it's a little presumptuous to assume that every new player has has the same context that I or anyone else would have going into it. Couple that with Sephiroth potentially being the one from the end of Advent Children who lived on and is able to transcend time. And you have neat callbacks that if handled correctly, new players would at least be able to go. Okay, I don't have any particular attachment to them, but at least I vaguely understand what's happening. It's a bit too much too fast, jumping the gun on an otherwise really inventive and cool concept. That very fast pace, meant to show that the team is indeed wanting to do new things, unfortunately also feeds into this widespread Lamau Namura smelling his own kingdom farts mentality, since it is a fair point to see it clashing and pacing with the rest of the story, making it seem like Namura dunked that shit in right at the end of development, as unlikely a case as that may be. It's weird, it's crazy, but honest to god, it it was what I was wishing and hoping they would do ever since the whispers were shown off. The insane amount of catharsis coursing through my body when killing the Harbinger should be labeled as a goddamn health hazard. Of course, that's in part due to the good ol' Canon Caspers over there being very, very aggressive and very, very in your face throughout the remake, but that's review talk for another time. For now, I'll settle on acknowledging the ending's logistic faults, but that doesn't mean I'm not incredibly excited for what will come in the future. And I know I was throwing a little shade at KH beforehand, but if the remake series ends with Cloud and Zack fighting Sephiroth together a la Sora and Riku against Xemnas, I don't know what I'll think about it since I'll be screaming too loud to hear my own thoughts. And so, the ending is unraveled. My general thoughts about it have been discussed, and I think it's about time to enter into the home stretch. To delve a little deeper past the very pretty assets and character models to the storytellers behind the scenes. Here we are, finally nearing the end. As I stated previously, the team behind 7 Remake is an all-star cast of both the old and the new. The ones I already mentioned being Tetsuya Nomura as director slash concept designer, and Yoshinori Kitase as producer. These two being the original character designer and director of Final Fantasy VII respectively. They also held executive producer roles in the development of Crisis Core. The scenario writer for the original game also returns in the remake in the form of Kazushige Nojima. Nojima in particular holding a similar role in nearly every single part of the compilation since the start. They're joined by those who are fans of Final Fantasy VII and played it when it first came out. People like co-director Naoki Hamaguchi and battle director Teruki Endo. Now if I listed everyone's involvement with the remake for the rest of the video, I might as well just roll the game's end credits. But you can probably tell from those that I just listed, this is no haphazardly thrown together team. This is a group who painstakingly mulls over every single decision, no matter how big or small. Now, most of the team's comments leading up to release are relatively standard fare, but some do give insight how long this has been circulating in the minds of the creative leads. As Nomura states in an interview on the Square Enix website, I started up the Final Fantasy VII Remake project around the time of compilation of Final Fantasy VII. We'd gone through Advent Children, Before Crisis, Crisis Core, and Dirge of Cerberus, and I was planning this by myself for about a year as the fifth and final entry in the compilation. This lends even more credence to just how unexpectedly critical the compilation is to the remake, as it looks to have always been planned to be a part of it. The entire FF7 legacy has never fully left the hands of those who fathered it, for better and for worse in some cases. 
But regardless of quality, the passion from the team certainly never wavered. For the better part of a decade, there would always be a new installment in the Final Fantasy VII series, all eventually hitting a climax with this new remake project. The reason why all the chips are being put on the table now? Well, Nomura elaborates further in an interview with 4Gamer. When asked about how the remake got the green light, he states, to put it simply, one of the main reasons is the timing for the staff members that are developing the game, and how it worked out in our favor. Also, as we've seen, Square Enix now has more PlayStation 4 titles. So we felt that we could increase the console's popularity and make an announcement before those games release. And there's one more thing, we're hitting that age. He explains further, Of all the staff that worked on the original Final Fantasy VII and those who are working on the remake, I'm the youngest one. I'm 45 years old now. If we continued on without doing a remake, Katase and Nojima are well older than me. So yeah, with this timing and opportunity in mind, we decided to just go for it. It's mildly depressing, actually. Nomura basically says that if the remake project took much longer to come to fruition, there may be none of the original crew left to help usher the story into this new saga, and that it would have to be captained by an entirely new staff. A final crescendo for the international phenomenon before the time comes where its creators inevitably bow out from game development as a whole. Not because they want to, but because time marches forward whether they like it or not. With this in mind, it's no wonder the team would go through even more stress than they normally would. Except Nomura, who was apparently big chillin'. From the same interview, Katase and Nojima felt it a lot, but I'm the type that doesn't really feel any pressure at all. Which, you know what, I can't blame them. When you're swimming in Kingdom Hearts money and are guaranteed to work on it for the next few decades, you can probably kick back and not worry too much. Don't get it twisted, homie obviously put in the work. It's just a very Nomura thing to say. Moving on, it's interesting to see just how much the personal perception and even direction of the team can be seen within the game itself, since the meta-narrative feels like it dives even deeper than it lets on. The whispers, while being explained in-universe as the will of the planet, are also very clearly a representation of the chains that bind the development team to recreating a story that's already been told. I mean, Jesus, most of them were the ones who told that very story. They are struggling struggling against doubt and indecision, and the whispers are their safe, predictable route to the end. The clear option of retreading the same story never goes away, and while on one hand it is the warm embrace that can save them from fumbling the project, on the other it silently smothers and rips away their creative freedom. And so, a choice is made, and the original game's message about acceptance is accompanied by one of achieving free will. Not only do the players achieve this, but so do the developers and a vast, open sky of possibility opens up to both. The inner turmoil I talked about can be seen even more intensely throughout the entirety of Chapter 18. The developers, like the characters, are scared of what lies ahead, of what awaits beyond this gargantuan leap into the unknown, but they steel themselves and soldier onwards, marching to tell this new story. Boundless, terrifying freedom, as Aerith puts it, but freedom nonetheless, and freedom that must be achieved no matter the cost, whether angering the older fans and subverting their expectations, or invoking the wrath of the whispers to wipe the party from the face of history. It doesn't matter from which end of the screen you look at it, it's a fear, both mentally and physically, that must be overcome for the sake of that freedom. And when it's all said and done, the actual fruits of this labor are nowhere in sight, the ultimate conclusion and payoff not even lingering on the horizon. As Sephiroth himself states, that which lies ahead does not yet exist, and until that time comes, that's how it will stay. That steel sky that kept them safe and sheltered now far behind them, as a new, unknown journey, just as or potentially even more arduous than the last, begins. 
but at least it'll be their journey and no one else's. Before wrapping this up, I'd like to highlight a specific interview from that piece on the Square Enix website that really strikes a chord with me, and that's the one with scenario writer Kazushige Nojima. He delves into how the team tackles the events in a modern fashion, but it's his comments on Cloud that I want to spotlight. He begins with, quote, It must have been in the very beginning stages of developing Final Fantasy VII Remake that I got to see the remake's version of Cloud for the first time. It wasn't post-Advent Children Cloud with kindness brimming from within. Rather, here was a young man with fiery features looking straight at me through the screen with aggression in his eyes. I knew right then, oh, this is it, end quote. Later on, he brings this back up. Quote, in Final Fantasy VII Remake, there will be much less room for player imagination. This fact will probably change the feel of the story considerably. People who know the original might not know quite how to take it, such is the fear that I have, but I also have conviction. It should be possible to feel a much deeper connection to Cloud as you join alongside him. It would be amazing if you could feel that fiery flame together with him. End quote. That very aggression and fiery passion that Cloud feels when confronted by the Whispers and the Singularity is the exact same emotion the team wanted the players to feel. That deep down, the player vies for the same freedom that lies beyond Destiny's crossroads, much like Cloud, even if they face it with confusion and frustration. Like I mentioned earlier, it is cathartic to defeat the Harbinger, this ever-present invasive and restrictive force. Of course, this is all subjective. Some may not care too much for this hyper-literal interpretation of this diverting storyline, or the fact that the storyline is trying to divert in the first place. However, for me, this sentiment and concept hit on every cylinder imaginable. It's a scary, unknown precipice, no doubt, but it's in the player's hands to follow the developers towards that great, never-ending sky. To one day come home, to one day meet with one that was thought to be lost, to one day face the reality of potentially losing one all over again, and to one day end it, once and for all. Until then, nothing but a promise, and the anticipation for what will come next, and I for one can't wait to see what the team does. Thank you guys for watching, and thank you to those who stuck through the entire thing. Be sure to leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more content like this. A special thank you again to Skilled Guy for providing the gameplay footage in the background. And this was unintentional, but the script came out as 7 pages, so I don't know whether to be filled with pride or just jump off a cliff. Anyways, this is a discussion video at heart, so please do share your thoughts in the comments below. I'd love to hear y'all out and give my piece as well. Even while recording this script, I thought about topics more and more, but I wanted to make sure my creation cycle wasn't lagging on this project for too long. Like how Remake shared many similarities with the Evangelion Rebuild films, among other things. But Ava is for another time. Wink wink, nudge nudge. Be sure to check out the ongoing Streets of Rage 4 playthrough I've got going as well. More videos to come. Have a nice day, and I'll catch y'all later.